Good job. Thank you. That's like really bright. My name, does that look high or something? It looks like it's in my nose. <laughs> Amy doesn't mind that. My name is Jason Johnson. I'm an alcoholic. Jason. Man, it's an honor and a privilege to be here. Uh, first, I need to thank the committee for inviting me. Sandy, thank you for not hugging me, I guess. You hugged everybody else that was up here, but <laughs> I'll let that slide. Um, yeah, okay. Steve, thank you for picking me up at the airport. Steve's a friend of mine, and his beautiful bride made me dinner last night. When somebody says, hey, you're going to stay at my house, and you're a speaker, that's like, oh, it could go either way. <laughs> I, hit the, I hit the lottery last night. I was sending pictures to Amy going, ha, ha, you're at a hotel. You know what I mean? But there's been many a times where you have to put that pin down and have a code word for them to come get you. Um, Kurt's just a lot of work, right? <laughs> I mean, a lot of work. He, he got in a fight once at a bar for tickling a guy. <laughs> I told him, you need to share in a general way and not bring the tickling part up. But that's a whole other story. Man. You're, gonna, you're probably not going to believe this. I have a sponsor. His name's Carl Morris. He's out of Covina, California. Uh, I'm his favorite. I'm self-appointed, but I'm his favorite. Amy knows that. Um... I go by the name, for Christ's sakes, Jason, and I got that here in Arkansas, right? Because I came here for a sober cup thing, and we, we rented a car, some of us, and we got in this car, and we went and ate at a Cracker Barrel, I think is what it's called. And we came out, there was like garbage cans blowing down the road, branches were falling off the trees, doors were slamming. It was windy, and it was raining, right? I mean, I'm not, not like God poured a bucket of water at one time right here. And uh, we got in the car, and man, we had the windshield wipers on really high. But you have to go fast because they weren't working. So I'm like going 80 miles an hour, and Carl's in the back seat, and he's like driving Miss Daisy, right? Because he's always wah, 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 wah. And all of a sudden, we see people pulling over, right? And I was like, well, they're just giving up, right? <laughs> I, I found out later there was a tornado coming, <laughs> and that's why they were pulling over. And I was told, for Christ's sakes, sakes Jason, please slow down. I added the please. He didn't add please. You can just imagine what he said. So that's where I got the name. Um, my home group is called Sandy's Kitchen. We meet on Tuesday nights in Happy Valley, Oregon. If you're ever in the state of Oregon and you need a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous or you know somebody in the Pacific Northwest that needs help, call me. You know, And if you don't my number, you can call the intergroup office or our, our thing and just say, hey, I need Jason Johnson. And unfortunately, they know who I am. And they will uh, give you a number to call. And, uh, you know, <clears throat> everything I have in my life, it's a value any good as a result of Alcoholics Anonymous. Anything I'm going to be. You know, if you're, if you're new here tonight, and I'm probably going to go on a tangent or something to forget to get sober, but well, there's two things you need to know. is Alcoholics Anonymous works, and God is real. Yeah. Right? And, and when I believed that, my life got better. <laughs> well, I already like this place. They clap for everything. <laughs> All right, let's just do this. My mom and dad got divorced when I was really young. Like, like you clap for that. <laughs> Wow, this is going to be different. I might need three bottles of water. Or it might be a two-hour talk at this rate, right? All right, so they got divorced. We're okay with that, I guess, here. My dad took off. My mom was a hippie. I used to call her old hippie, but she was like 22 or 23, so I guess she was young. And the reason I know my mom was a hippie because she smelled like hippies. I'm pretty sure you don't have hippies in Arkansas, but in Oregon they smell like patchouli oil or whatever that is, right? Oh, you're one right there? Now I'm sweating, right? I went from getting claps for a divorce and I have some hippie over here waving at me. Um, and, uh, you know, I, she smelt like that. And we lived up in the woods with a bunch of other hippies that smelt like that. And uh, we lived in a teepee. We lived in a log cabin once. We lived in a school bus before it was popular. We lived in, I told them, a house that looked like a, a gingerbread house built on the back of a truck. It had a, like a back porch and a rocking chair. And... Uh, what I know today is my mom grew pot for a living, right? And, well, I don't know if it was a living, but that's what they did. And all these hippies grew pot, and then they came down and sold it. You know, and at this, at this place we lived, man, it was kind of bizarre, right? Because in the day, everybody got along, but they would start drinking and doing other things, and they'd start beating on each other. And I'd see my mom get beat up on a regular basis, and I'd see my mom beat up other people on a regular basis. 
And I used to think, man, there might be something wrong with that. But in the morning, they'd be hugging each other and telling each other they loved them, each other, right? And so I didn't know that was wrong, right? What it did is it gave me some skills in life that when that violence starts going or you feel that, you learn how to de-escalate it by talking or you run and hide. And those were my skills as a little kid. That's what I did. And I didn't know there was anything wrong with that. I didn't know there was any leave it to beaver or anything like that. I just That's just what I did, right? And uh, when I started to go to school in kindergarten, my mom moved to town. And when my mom moved to town, her house was a party house, right? At 2 o'clock in the morning, there might be 20 people there. Or 2 o'clock in the morning, I might be the only one there. And as a little kid, you would think that was wrong or not right. But it didn't matter to me, right? I didn't know anything different. I learned how to make macaroni and cheese on the stove. I learned how to make popcorn on the stove. I learned how to draw a bath as a little kid. And I learned right away that when it gets dark outside and there's nobody there, you pull down all the shades, turn on all the lights, and turn the TV up really loud. That way, if somebody comes to break in, they're going to think there's a party there, and they're going to go to the neighbor's house. It worked. I'm here, right? My neighbor's not dead, though. And that was my life skills, right? Again, I didn't know there was any leave it to beaver. I didn't know people's parents read in big books. Or in big books, Jesus. <laughs> Maybe that's what they should do, right? <laughs> read them stories. I didn't know people, you know, I, just, I didn't know anything about that because I didn't, I didn't experience it, right? So I didn't miss it. But what happened was when I was getting ready to go into the first grade, it was a Sunday before school was going to start, and my life took a dramatic change, right? I was at home watching this show called Happy Days. Thank God, right? I, young people are like Googling it, right? Trying to figure out. And then they laugh like that like two minutes later, right? So I'm at home watching this show, Happy Days, and the phone starts ringing. And it's not like today where it goes to voice message or it has like call ID. It rings until that person gives up, right? Or you pick it up, right? And it rang all the way to a commercial, right? And I'm thinking, man, that's some dedication, right? And uh, so I pick it up, and man, it's my grandma, right? And I don't know if there's any grandparents in here, grandmas. But, man, you're way too invested in your grandkids' life, right? You want to know, have you got your clothes laid out? Have you taken a bath? Have you eaten dinner? Are you excited to go to school? Stuff that has absolutely nothing to do with happy days, right? And I'm just saying yes, so she'll get off the phone. And my show's back on, and I can see it on. And I told my grandma, hey, i got to go. My show's back on. And she says, sweetie, let me talk to your mom. I said, oh, my mom's not here. She's at the tavern. The phone number's 282-4440. You call there. This guy Floyd's going to answer the phone. He's going to tell you, give you a few minutes. Your mom, my mom's going to come to the phone, and she's going to tell you she's having one more pitcher of beer, and she'll be home, right? And there was like a long pause. I'm like, Grandma, my show's back on. I got to go. And she says, sweetie, give me that number again, and I gave it to her. And she said, when your show's over, I want you to go to bed, and when you get up to go to school in the morning, I want you to listen to what the teacher says and be nice to the other kids. Basically, that's what Carl tells me every day. Just be nice to others and generous with your time, and you should be all right. But I said, okay, and I hung up that phone, and... And now I'm watching this show called Laverne and Shirley, right? And, uh, and there's a knock at the door, right? And I kind of, like, stop and st- what I'm doing. I hear a pounding on the door, right? And I get scared, and I crawl underneath this end table, right? Because I, I know something's not good. And all of a sudden, they start beating on the window on the side of the house. And I'm, I think for sure I'm dead, right? So I'm sitting behind these pillows. I'm just scared. And all of a sudden, I hear this Jason open the door. It's Grandma. Man, I came right out from underneath that table because that's like hitting the lottery, Right, grandma's here, right? And I open up that door, and my grandma's standing there, and she didn't look like grandma, right? She looked like she was crying. She looked mad. She just didn't have that, hey, let's go attitude that she usually does. And she looked right at me, and she said, sweetie, get your stuff. You're coming to live at my house. That's like hitting the lottery, right? Because when you go to grandma's house, there's Rice Krispie treats. There's homemade cookies. There's popsicles in the freezer. The sheets are on bed. The sheets are on the bed. The sheets match the pillowcases. But most importantly, there's somebody there all the time. Right? That's an easy sell, man. I grab my little bit of stuff. I jumped into her car. We get to her house. I run up these stairs. I'm cutting through the front room, headed to the kitchen. I hear this, hey! And I turn around. It's my grandpa. He's like, what are you doing here? It's like, man, I live here now. Right? <laughs> I didn't realize my grandma didn't run it by him. <laughs> Found that out later. But what he did is he looked right at me. He says, yeah, you do, buddy. Come here. And he gave me a hug, and I fell asleep on that man's lap for the next four or five years every single night. Because he made me feel safe. Look, and I wasn't an easy kid. I ended up in AA. Right? And uh, look, my grandma would drop me off at Sunday school on Sunday. And she would just push me in the room and say, he has an enthusiasm for life. And then she would shoot down the hall. Right? <laughs> my grandpa would drop me off at Sunday school and say, look, don't let his cuteness get in the way of your common sense. He's either going to be in trouble or talking his way out of trouble. That's all you need to know about that kid. And I used to think that's kind of odd. Right? 
But here's what I know today. I remember being in the third grade in Miss Bo's class, and uh, we were going to have dress-up day on Friday, and everybody was going to dress up what they wanted to be when they grew up, right? And it was Wednesday, and I remember sitting in this class, and I remember that I could see everything today. We're all sitting there, and she's going up and down the rows, and she's asking people, what do you want to be? And there was doctors, firemen, lawyers, presidents of the United States, whatever, you know, everybody had a job, and she got to me, and she said, Jason, what are you going to be when you grow up? I said, a bank robber, right? (laughs) Yeah, she didn't laugh, right? (laughs) Two of my friends changed occupations, right, like that, and I had a gang, just, it wasn't hard to do, right? (laughs) I'll be a bank robber, right? And my, you know, and so I got sent home with a letter, and I came back as a rodeo clown. (laughs) (laughs) Don't even know where that came from, right? And, uh, and I remember that Saturday sitting under this apple tree with, with my friend Stevie, who was going to be a police officer when he grew up. And he said, you're going to be a bank robber? I said, yes, I am. But I said, there's no banks on our block to practice with, right? Because we played cowboys and Indians and cops and robbers all the time, but there was no banks. And so he mentioned that there was a Kool-Aid stand up on the corner. And I did what every good young man does. I got me a cowboy hat, a bandana, and a BB gun. And I rode my bike up to the Kool-Aid stand, and I robbed it, right? And... Uh, Look, if you're going to rob a Kool-Aid stand, you're a little old. But if you ever do, if you get to that point in your life, that bottom, they don't have any money. All they have is Kool-Aid, right? And uh, I watch TV, right? And so I took a kid hostage. I told everybody, go home and get their piggy banks and meet me in my backyard, and I'll give you your friend back, right? So I take this kid to my house. I tie him up to the clothesline pole. And we're discussing life. And he, I hear this, Jason Dinner. And at 5 o'clock at my house every night is dinner. If you don't go eat dinner, you don't eat. I was like, man, I got to go. I'll be back in about 20 minutes. So I put my BB gun down and my bandana and my cowboy hat down there. And I went inside and I'm eating dinner and everything's going great. Until I got my first police contact in the third grade, right? And uh, the police showed up, one officer. And when an officer shows up back then, the whole neighborhood shows up. So everybody's in my backyard looking at this kid. And I'm trying to explain to my grandma the knots wouldn't be that tight if he wasn't squirming around. And, and, it, and it's just not going really well, right? And all of a sudden, my grandpa starts laughing, like really loud, right? And my grandma goes, what's so funny? He's like, man, you can't make this up. And then everybody laughed, right? And that sent that lady in a tailspin. She said, Jason, get in the house. You're grounded for a month. I'd never been grounded before, but I started crying, right? And all of a sudden, my grandpa said, hold on a second. And he took my mom, grandma behind the house because you don't argue in public, I guess, back then. And they did some negotiating, and they came back out. My grandpa told everybody, look, I didn't tie that young man up to the clothesline pole. There's no need to punish me by grounding you to the inside of the house for 30 days, right? <laughs> You're grounded to the block. And, man, that right away, that guy became my hero, right? He, he taught me that when you get caught, you share in a general way. <laughs> you leave out the tickling. <laughs> uh, but what happened with that relationship with my dad, grandpa, as I got older, he became a problem. Right. I, I don't think he really liked me. I think I was a burden on him. Right. He was retired. And all of a sudden he had this young kid and I thought he hated me. Right. Because he was always turning me in, telling the police where I worked, how much money I made. I mean, he was bad for my crime. <laughs> but what I know today, he was a good man. Right. He's the kind of guy that if he dropped a quarter on the ground, he'd spend a dollar to get it back to you if he knew it was yours. And so I grew apart from him, right? As I got older, he just became a problem. My grandma, on the other hand, I thought she just felt sorry for me. I don't know if anybody in here has a nephew and grandkid or something like that that you have, right? But I remember being that kid and looking at everybody because anytime somebody, my aunts or uncles, went on vacation, they had to take me. If I had a baseball game or a football game or a soccer game, everybody showed up. And the only reason that is is because my grandma told them to. I know that's what it was, right? And so I just thought she felt sorry for me. But that changed. When I was in the sixth grade, I got moved to a middle school, and I had to take a bus. And that week, the first three months, I got kicked off the school bus. Imagine that. And I had to walk home. And I remember walking out for my first day, walking home. And my grandma was coming in, and I thought she came to rescue me because that's what grandmas do. And she said, no, we need to go in here and talk to some people. We went into this hallway, went down this classroom. We went in this room, and there was a round table, and there was a teacher with a a teacher from a special needs school, the principal, a counselor, and a couple of my teachers that I had in the sixth grade. They sat on one end of the table, and on the other side of the table, there was two chairs, and my grandma and I sat down. And they proceeded to tell my grandma everything I'd done wrong in the last first three months of school, that I had no self-control, that I hit other people, that I talked all the time, that I couldn't read or write at that level. I mean, they made me sound pretty bad. And uh, my grandma didn't say anything. 
She just sat there. She didn't negotiate with them. She didn't try to defend me. She just sat there and listened. And when they got done, she said, may I say something? I was like, finally. And she said, uh, they said, sure. And she said, look, I'm not going to deny Jason did any of those things. He lives at my house. He's a tough kid, but he's a good person and he's a good kid. And the reason I know this is every morning on his way to school, he runs down to Mrs. Harrington's house and he throws her newspaper up on the front porch so she doesn't have to come down the stairs. And the young man, Shane, who's simple-minded, every time I see him at church on Sunday or the grocery store, the first thing he asks is, where's Jason? Because nobody picks on him when Jason's around. And when they play sports, Jason always picks him first to be on his team. Nobody told him to do those things. He did them on his own. So I know there's a good kid inside of there. It's our responsibility to tap into that. Right? And I ended up having my best year of school. And I remember, most importantly, I remember walking out of that classroom and walking out that hall and looking at my grandma and for the first time in my life believing somebody loved me. Right? I never felt anybody stick up for me. I never, I didn't know anybody paid attention to what I did. Right? And that lady became my best friend. Man, wherever she went, I went. But you know what? That year, that kid I tied up to the clothesline pole, Sean, became one of my best friends. I guess I took him hostage, so maybe I need Alan on. Right? And we went over to my buddy Leif's house, and we're going to sleep in the backyard. In the state of Oregon, you sleep in the backyard three nights a year. Right? It's not a big day. You get it when you get it. Right? And uh, it's that Friday night. We go over to Leif's house, and we're setting our stuff up in the backyard. And Leif's mom, Molly, comes out and says, hey, I ordered you guys a pizza. There's $10 on the counter. When the pizza guy gets here, pay him his money and stay in the house. All the adults are going bowling. Man, that's like hitting the lottery, too. Right? So the pizza came. We paid him. We have a telephone. We're just doing whatever you do as a little kid, right, with a telephone back then. And uh, and all of a sudden, Leif says, hey, pizza tastes better with beer. I had never drank beer before, but I said, yes, it does. And he went downstairs, and he got a case of Lucky Lager. It was, yeah, it was nasty. I don't know if they have that back here, but it was nasty, right? When I got my first drink of alcohol, I didn't get that ooh feeling, or I didn't feel like I'd arrived. I had to hold my nose and hang in there, right? But I did good. I hung in there, and... You know, eventually we're throwing rocks at cars and living in the backyard and doing whatever you do. And, man, all of a sudden I got food poisoning, right? Man, I was sick a couple hours later. And I'm talking like sick, sick, right? I was like, I looked at my buddies and said, man, I got to go home. I got food poisoning. That pizza is no good. <laughs> and uh, I rode my bike home. My friend Leif says that was my first DUI, right? And uh, I get home and I, drive, I run up the stairs and... I walk through the house, I tell my grandma I don't feel good, she just looks at me kind of like in disgust, and I go back, and I'm sick all night, and that lady didn't do her job, right? She didn't put a towel on the pillow, she didn't move the garbage can, she didn't open. I was sick all night, and she never came in to check on me, right? And finally, I fall asleep, and I wake up the next morning, and my grandpa's at the end of my bed yelling, get up, you got to go to work. I was like, man, I don't feel good, Gramps. He said, get up, you got to go to work. I said, I don't have a job. He said, if you're going to drink like a big boy, you're going to work like a big boy. Now let's go. And I thought for sure my grandma would solve this, right? And, but as I'm walking out the door, she handed me a warm egg salad sandwich and a thermos of warm milk and told me, have a great day. <laughs> and we went and picked up Leif and Sean, who looked just as bad as I felt. And my grandpa took us to pick strawberries, right? It's against the law for a minor, anybody under 12 years of age, to pick strawberries in the state of Oregon now. <laughs> That might be the only thing I'm famous for, right? Because <laughs> I picked strawberries, I got sick. I picked strawberries, I got sick. I got, it was bad, right? My grandpa's on this tailgate of his truck, drinking his coffee, reading his paper, laughing at me, right? So I look at my buddies. I said, man, I'm not drinking alcohol anymore. I'm not done with beer. And they said, you didn't like the beer? I said, I don't mind the beer. I just don't want to work, right? <laughs> so I quit cold turkey. No AA, no 12 steps. I just didn't want to pick strawberries is what it came down to. And and I did really good until I got to high school. And when I got to high school, this is by the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. I learned this is where the allergy and the obsession kicked in for me. Because what I know today is I started saving my lunch money Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, sh- pitching it in with some other guys on Friday, shoulder tapping, and drinking on the weekends. We played sports during the week, and we drank on the weekends. Nobody was dying of a heroin overdose. Nobody's crashing cars into trees yet. We were just having fun. And, and that's how my life was. But that's what all I want. All I ever thought about is what are we going to do on the weekend? I play, I was okay at sports, so I did good, and then I drank on the weekends, and that's what it was. On uh, May 5th, 1989, I, uh, Carl says, I have to tell you the truth. I stole the motorcycle. I used to say I borrowed it. Uh, I stole this motorcycle, and I got in a high-speed chase, I guess, and I woke up in a, high, a hospital in an ICU unit not knowing what's going on, right? And I remember laying, coming to, and I'm in this room with a sliding glass door, and I started screaming, I'm alive, and this lady came in and started talking to me. 
I asked her what happened. She said, you're in a drunk driving accident. I said, oh. She said, on a motorcycle. I said, oh, I don't own a motorcycle. Right? And she goes, we know. And uh, <laughs> that solved that problem right there. And I remember asking her, am I going to die? She said, you're not going to die, but you'll probably lose your left leg. And if you don't lose your left leg, you'll never walk normal again. And I remember laying in that bed thinking, I'm okay with that. I didn't kill anybody else, and I didn't kill myself. I'll never drink alcohol again. But about two weeks after getting out of that hospital, the only thing that made life okay was putting alcohol in my body. Right? And eventually I would drink to get away that anxiety, that fear, that, that drama that I had going on in my head, and I would drink. And I just kept lowering my standards to keep up with my quality of life. Right? So eventually I'm living in a house that has no power and no water. It's somebody's uncle's house until the police come, then nobody knows whose house that is. I don't know if you have that here in Arkansas, but they're pretty famous in Portland right now. Um, and, and I was okay with that, right? Alcohol made that okay. What, how I was living made that okay. But about every two or three weeks, one of my uncles would show up where I was at and, and come get me, and they drag me down to a payphone, and they say, you got to call Grandma. I go, why is that? They go, because she calls every hospital, every institution, all your friends, and then she calls all of us every single morning. Has anybody seen Jason? Anybody know where Jason is? Is Jason alive? Can somebody please go find Jason? So you need to call her and tell her you're okay. And I call my grandma, and I tell her I, was, I got a job, and I'm working out of town, and I'm doing really good. And I'll come see you tomorrow, or I'll come see you when I get back to town. Man, and I meant that with all my heart. I love that lady with more than anything I've ever loved anything in my life, Right? But I'm an alcoholic and I'm powerless over alcohol. And what I would do is I'd take a drink and I could justify not going. I would think to myself, if I don't see you in face to face, I'm not lying to you. I'm not cheating from you and I'm not stealing from you. So I'm really doing you a favor. Right? And I didn't know my grandma didn't have a solution. She didn't have Al-Anon. She just had her church. And I remember every once in a while I'd show up or my, go over to my grandma's house because I needed five bucks. And this is what she would do. I knew this from doing the steps. We'd sit at her table, and she would go to the bathroom, and she'd either leave 10 bucks under a napkin or 10 bucks hanging out of her purse, and I would steal it because that's what I do, right? And I'd do that over and over and over, you know, and I just, I just, I could justify that, right? I don't know if anybody is in here is, is, knows that feeling of just desperation where you make it okay. You just keep taking those decisions, and I just kept doing that. On probably December 1st, 1997, my Uncle Leroy, who's a big biker guy, showed up at my tent. I had got kicked out of an abandoned house and had to live in the backyard. So things were going really good for me at that time. He said, hey, your grandma's been in ICU for a couple weeks. They took her off of life support. You need to come say goodbye. I said, I don't really want to go. And he said, I didn't ask you if you wanted to go. You're going to go. Right? And he's like the size of Steve, and so I had to go. And uh, I got in his truck, and he handed me a pint of vodka, and he said, here, just drink this. And I chugged that vodka down, and when we got to that hospital, you go up the elevator, and when you get off this elevator, you're in a big room, and all I have a big family, and they're all on this side of the room, because they only let two or three people into this room at a time. And when I got off the elevator, I didn't even look over there, because I know I'm a piece of shit that's not going to amount to nothing. I know I'm the guy that has no... I'm, I'm the guy, I'm the guy, this, this. I remember I'd go to, sometimes i get invited to family reunions, and there would be a commercial for a treatment center. Everybody would stop what they were doing and come look at me, Right? <laughs> I'm that guy in the family, right? And, uh, and I didn't need anybody to tell me that, right? So I sat on this side of the room, and my mom didn't even come over and talk to me. And finally, my aunt came over and said, you need to get in there, say goodbye, and get out of here. And I said, okay. And I went in there. My Uncle Gary and my Uncle John were in there. And my Uncle Gary said to me, he said, man, just talk to her like she's here. Hold her hand and talk to her. She hasn't been awake all day, but just talk to her like she's here. And I said, okay. And he said, take as long as you want. Don't worry about anybody else. My Uncle Gary and I are close. She's only seven years older than me, and we're like brothers. We go in the same house. And so I grabbed my grandma's hand, and I started talking to her, and she opened up her eyes, and then she started talking back to me, and I panicked, right? I didn't know how to handle that, right? And I just got scared because people had flown in from everywhere, and they all ran to the room, and everybody's trying to jockey in to get in there. And I just told her, Grandma, I'm doing really good. I have a great job. But there's a lot of people here that would like to see you. I'm going to go home, and I'll come back tomorrow, and I'll visit when less people are here. And she said, okay, and she told me she would pray for me and that she loved me, and I told her I loved her. But I remember walking out that door, and she told my Uncle Gary, he's a good kid. He's going to do something with his life. You just watch. And I remember hearing that and just thinking, man, just let me go, right? And I went back to my tent, and I drink like you drink, right? And a couple days later, my Uncle Dale showed up, and he let me know that my grandma had passed, and his family would come pick me up, and I could sit with them at the memorial. And I said, okay. And that day that memorial came, and I hid in a banded house with some gold slogger and some Jägermeister, and I hid in a closet, and I didn't come out. Right? Because I was too 
I don't know, man. I can't, alcohol makes it okay to hide in there, right? I was too embarrassed. I was too ashamed. I didn't know how to handle that. And, and I stayed in there, and I could hear him yelling, you're going to regret this the rest of your life. I just do another shot. You know, you're gonna, this is the worst decision you ever made. I did another shot, and I didn't come out. And, uh, you know, a couple of weeks go by, and this is where my life started getting kind of out of track. I mean, it was going really good up to this point, right? <laughs> it was a Sunday, and I remember thinking, man, nobody said my name in like a week or two. Nobody was talking to me. And I went to a payphone. I called my Uncle Gary Collect. I asked him if he was going to church. He said yes. I asked him if I could meet him there. He said yes. I knew he was going to beat me up, <laughs> right, because we're brothers. Brother, but I didn't think he'd beat me up in church, right? And so I get to this church, and we're sitting in this church, and everybody's at that end of the pew, and the whole church is on that side of the thing, and I'm over here by myself, right? And uh, they start singing this song, How Great Thou Art, right? I, I never really – I started getting caught up in the moment. And then they sing that dang song, Amazing Grace. And I looked at my uncle. I said, hey, I think I have a drinking problem. And he's like, you think? And the whole church went quiet, right? <laughs> my aunt said the song was over. I thought I thought it was because of that. And I scooted over. I said, I might have a drug problem, too, if it makes you feel better about yourself. And this is what he said to me. Come over to my house. We'll feed you. We'll wash your clothes. And I'll give you 20 bucks to figure your life out. And I said, great. And I went to his house. And when I came out of the shower, there was a Phone book on the counter. I don't know if everybody knows what a phone book this is. A pretty, yeah, it's like Google, but the hard way. And uh, he says you're going to go to treatment. I said, "What's that?" He said, "Oh, this is no time for you to negotiate and call hospitals and tell me you have a drug drinking problem and drug problem." I said, "Okay." It's Sunday afternoon. I didn't think anybody would answer, so I called Portland Adventist because it's at the top of the page. This lady answers. I told her, "Hey, my uncle thinks I have a drinking problem." Man, she got all excited, kind of like Kurt. <laughs> you know what I mean? And. Uh, she passed me over to somebody else. I told that lady, I might have a drug problem. And man, she was so excited that she said, can you be here tomorrow at 8 a.m.? I said, absolutely. She said, uh, good, I'll see you then. We'll do an assessment. If we can't help you, we'll find some place to put you. I told my uncle, hey, I got this assessment thing tomorrow. Give me 20 bucks. I'll tell you how it went. And he said, no, you're staying the night at my house. <laughs> yeah. He has a plastic couch. It's not leather, right? <laughs> The sheet was gone in the first roll. I'm sweating. I'm sticky from the inside out. This damn dog's licking me all night. And, and, and it's just bad. And, and I, the next morning, he goes, man, you look like crap. You should take another shower. And I was like, man, I wanted to tell him, yeah, if you slept on a plastic couch with a dog licking you all night, you'd be miserable too. And I went in, took a shower. And when he went to take a shower, all of a sudden I remembered he had a liquor cabinet. And I went to that liquor cabinet, and I got a Coke out of the refrigerator, and I filled it up with Bacardi 151, I started drinking it. So by the time he was out of the shower, I'm ready to go to treatment. I don't know what it is, but I'm all in, baby. We get in his car, we're driving, he looks at me and says, I smell alcohol. I said, it's not me, I'm going to treatment. <laughs> Which, today I hear that a lot, right? Uh, so we get to the treatment center, I made, a, I made another big mistake. I, uh, I went to go hide my pop can in the bathroom. He went in, he answered some questions, and I was in treatment just like that, right? They didn't ask me if I had a problem. They said, hey, you're admitted. And uh, it was December 29th, 1997. I checked into an Adventist treatment center. It's not a good call, right? Because they have no caffeine, no sugar, and no women. Those are big deals when you're 29 years old living in a bush, right? <laughs> not a bush bush, but a tent. Don't get too, I wasn't that bad, you know what I mean? And... Uh, and I was like, I thought, I thought treatment was like detox and treatment was like prison, right? I thought you had, not that I'd been there yet, but I thought like you had to escape, right? I didn't know you could just leave. So I'm watching shift changes. I'm watching the elevator go up and down. I'm figuring out what counselor I could punch and beat up and maybe escape. I'm out of here, man, because this is ridiculous, right? So as I'm negotiating in my head how I'm going to do this and I'm taking notes, I hear these four other guys that need to be in treatment start talking about Alcoholics Anonymous. I said, hey, what's Alcoholics Anonymous? Man, and they shared the miracle. They did. They said, there's, there's caffeine, there's sugar, and there's women. I said, I'm in, right? How do we get there? They said, a van's going to pick us up. I'm like, even better. I can escape from there, right? And uh, we get in this van, and I need to tell you about my, about three years before all this went down, my dad had called my mom out of the blue to pay back all the back child support he owed. Right? I went to this bank to get my half of the money, which I paid back because of sponsorship. And I uh, said hi to this guy for about 30 seconds because I don't need a dad. I took my half of the money. I went and did what I did. I'm in this van going to this AA meeting, and I pray to a God that I don't really, you know, I know he's out there. I just don't want to run into him, right? <laughs> but I said, please, God, don't let me know anybody in AA. And if I do, please don't let me owe him any money, 
right? That, I, didn't, I don't care about staying sober or anything like that, and then hopefully I can get married, right? We get to this meeting. <laughs> we get to this meeting. There's caffeine, there's sugar, and there's some women, and I'm looking around this meeting trying to figure out who I'm going to you know, date so they can break me out of this treatment center, and uh, I see a guy standing in the back with some other guys. I told these guys, hey, man, that looks like my dad. They're like, you don't know who your dad is? I said, I've seen him one time like in 27 years. So there's a break in the meeting. I don't go to meetings with breaks. And so I wasn't anymore. So I walked up to this guy, and he's standing there. I said, hey, do you know who I am? He said, nope. I said, I think you're my dad. <laughs> and he said, Jason? And I said, yeah, and I met my dad at my very first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> yeah. I guess that's a burning bush, right? <laughs> but I still questioned it, right? And, uh, you know, he hugged me. He told me if I did this thing, my life would get better. What I know today that he was doing a ninth step. Right. And, and here's the bizarre thing. I remember as a little kid, my grandma used to always tell me God never says no. He either says yes, not right now, or I got something better. I thought that was the stupidest thing in the world. But I'm here to tell you, I remember being a little kid sitting on that front porch on Fridays, waiting for my mom or dad to come pick me up to take me for the weekend. And I remember one weekend they didn't show, which they hardly ever showed. If anybody showed, my dad never showed. But I remember walking into that kitchen that night, and I looked at my grandma, and I said, I'm not going to Sunday school anymore. And she said, why is that? I said, I've been praying to that Jesus guy every morning and every night for two weeks that my mom or my dad would come pick me up this weekend and take me somewhere, and they didn't show up. I don't think he likes me, so I'm not going to waste my time there. And she just looked at me, and she said, okay. And I went in, and I got on my grandpa's lap, and I told my grandpa, I'm never going to sit on that front porch again. He said, buddy, you never have to sit on that front porch ever again if you don't want to. And I said, okay. And I made a decision right there. I don't need a mom or dad, and I don't need a God. As a little kid, I'm here to tell you 27 years later, I'm sitting on that front porch waiting for members of Alcoholics Anonymous to come pick me up and take me to a meeting. And it's not like today where they text you. They start honking like three blocks away, right, to let everybody know we're picking Jason up and taking him to AA, right? (laughs) And I run down that car to get in, and you know who's there to pick me up? It's my dad to take me to my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous out of my treatment center. God either says yes, not right now, or I got something better. I just have to trust the process. He took me to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. I met this girl. I kissed her. She got pregnant. She got divorced. And then we got married. Yeah, there's some people in here going, oh, this is the Bible Belt. That's how I did her, right? And, uh, yeah, that's not recommended, right? And... Uh, you know, my life started getting better, but I, uh, I got a job, I got a kid, I got a wife, and uh, I was going to one meeting a month, I was a speaker's meeting, I was, I was on fire. It was called SSAL, Sit Down, Shut Up and Listen, it was about six, 700 people, and uh, the reason I went there is because I was the raffle chair, and I was stealing half the money. I had to pay it back, you just got to watch out who you get for a sponsor, right, if you're going to be a thief, and uh but I was only going because of that, right? And it was a Saturday at the meeting, and my wife was on the committee. She said, I'm going to go to the meeting. I said, I don't want to go. So I asked her for a divorce. <laughs> I said, good thinking to me, right? And she said, no. I didn't know you could just say no. I thought you had to argue or at least get an attorney. She goes, I'm going to A. Maybe you should go. And I said, screw Alcoholics Anonymous. And she took off. And I did what every good member of AA is going to do when you're getting ready to resign from AA. I went and got a Bible, a big book, and I got on the computer, and I wrote a resignation letter to Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> I wish they would have had an AI back then because it wasn't great, right? And uh, I dated it. I signed it. I folded it up, and I was going to take it to this guy, John B. John B. was the chair of the meeting. I thought he was the president of AA in Oregon because he had a whole bunch of nodigans, right? I don't know. You guys call them sponsees, pigeons. I call them nodigans. You know, they're the greeters at the door. And when you pull in the parking lot, you're like, good God, not again, because they're going to want to hug you, touch you, right? Or they get called on. They talk about God, sponsorship, the allergy. Stuff has absolutely nothing to do with AA in my book, but... So I would just call them all nodigans, and he had a lot of them, right? And so uh, I get to this meeting. He's at the front. I walk up. I hand him my resignation letter. He starts reading. He starts laughing, like, really loud, and the nodigans are swarming around, and they're posting the letter around, and they're laughing, and I'm just sweating, right? And uh, he says, no. <laughs> I go, what do you mean, no? He goes, I'm not going to allow you to leave Alcoholics Anonymous. And what accidentally came out of my mouth is, will you sponsor me? <laughs> yeah, he quit laughing just like that. He's like... Are you willing to go to any link for victory over alcohol? I'm like, Jesus, I was just resigning with a letter that's going to haunt me for the next rest of my life, right? Yes. He said, this is what you're going to do. You're going to get on your knees every morning. You're going to say, please help. Thank you. Amen. And at night, you're going to get on your knees and you're just going to say, thanks. God, don't need to hear anything else from you, right? 
I say, what about my sobriety? He goes, you got a lot more problems than your sobriety. Let's just, let's just ask for all the help you can get. And he said, you're going to go to five meetings a week to where I'm. I thought that was a little overkill. I had to call him every morning at 630 in the morning. I had to read two pages out of the big book. And I couldn't drink in between meetings. And he said, if you're going to do that, your life's going to get better in spite of you. I said, all right. And you know what? In 30 days, I was a not again, right? I was the head greeter. Well, I tell myself I was the head greeter. My job in Alcoholics Anonymous was to shake every woman's hand that walked in the door and look them in the eye and make sure they felt safe and got a seat, right? Every man that walked through the door, I had to hug and tell them I'm doing better every day in every way. Very unnecessary, very uncalled for, very awkward, right? Some of those guys hugged me two or three times, right? And, and I did it, right? And I started getting involved in Alcoholics Anonymous and I learned the steps and John saved my life. But here's for a guy like me, I had nine years of sobriety and I, I couldn't stand you, right? I knew what Joe was going to say at the meeting. I know Kurt was going to be happy and go lucky. I knew Amy was going to try to make me cry. It was like wah, wah, wah all the time, right? And so I started selling drugs. <laughs> like nobody's ever thought of selling drugs sober, for Christ's sakes. So I was going to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. I wasn't drinking or using and I was selling dope, and I got pretty good at it, right? And so I bought me a car. I took it to Les Schwab. I put some wheels and tires on. I don't know if they have that here, and uh, it's a tire place. I pulled out. My wheel fell off, and I crashed. But don't worry. It was their fault. They rented me a car. It was a Chrysler 300. It looked like a Rolls Royce. It said Hemi on the side. It had tinted windows. I thought I had arrived, right? And I got in this car, and I went and met this guy I'd been meeting every day for about a year. I get in my car, and I'm driving down the road, and all of a sudden... They call, I guess they call it a task force. A whole bunch of cop cars swarmed my car, right? But look, I, at first I didn't know they were looking for me. But if they were, I have a valid driver's license, proof of insurance. I had to drink a drug in nine years. I go to Alcoholics Anonymous, and I have a valid, you know, it's a rental car. So I have a valid reason for being in this car. So I took the drugs and put them under the front seat because I didn't know where else to put them, right? And so I have a small basketball size of methamphetamine while well, they weighed it at 157 grams. But... <laughs> I had this small basketball size, and I put it under the seat. And finally, an officer walks up, and he taps on the window. And I roll it down because I didn't want them to know I knew they were there. And he said, Jason, which is another bad sign. He didn't even ask me for my ID. He said, could you shut the car off and step up on the curb? And I said, yeah, I could do that. And I shut that car off, and I opened up that door. And as I'm getting out of here, and I look down, and the seat's moving back all by itself. <laughs> yeah, you can't yell time out, right? Or do over, or... <laughs> You, you really can't reach under and push it, right? And, and, and the seat, I never had a car with a memory seat. I never will, right? <laughs> I, I delete that shit right away. But it went all the way back, and my dope's in the middle of the floor, right? And uh, I thought, well, maybe they won't see it, right? <laughs> so I shut the door, and I went up on the curb, and they did. And I got charged with commercial delivery, commercial possession, racketeering, intimidation of a federal witness, and a gun charge with nine years of sobriety, going to AA meetings, judging you people. And I burned it to the ground. I put a needle on my arm, and I drank like you never drank before. My wife had divorced me. I was like, man, she divorced me at my bottom, which I thought was a bad idea, which was actually probably a pretty good idea. She has remarried me, right, which I think is a great move on her behalf. AA in my area is like, why would you marry that guy again? Man, you had it out. God did that for you. Uh, you know, and I remember the lowest point for me was my daughter was seven at the time. And I remember Julie had let me come over to their house and maybe take a shower and see my daughter if I looked like I was going to be okay. I, like if I wasn't going to sort bolts in the, gar in the garage or mow the yard in the night with a flashlight tied to a hard hat or something like that. <laughs> and this night, this day I'm in the house and I'm, I'm taking a shower and I come out. And when my daughter was born, we saved those quarters when they started putting the states on the back. And we had two or three buckets of them. And my wife's coming down the hall, and she has these buckets, and she said, you stole your daughter's money. Who steals a little kid's money, right? But alcohol makes that okay, and I can justify that. Because in my head, I'm saying to her, my, in my head, I'm thinking, she wouldn't have that money if I wouldn't have put it in there. But what happened is my daughter started tugging on my wife's shorts, telling, please don't make my daddy leave. I let him borrow it. When that little girl was born, I held her. I told her nobody would ever hurt her or steal from her, and she would never want for anything. And I realized right then and there that I did all that myself to my own daughter. And I went and did what I had to do, and I ran. I got sentenced to 48 months in prison, and uh, 
My first three weeks, I uh, was in the hole because if you ever get arrested in the state of Oregon, I'm just going to tell you this secret. They've been running the jail system since the 1800s. They don't need your opinion. Right? <laughs> Obviously, I gave them my opinion. I'm in solitaire, but here's what happened. I'm locked up by myself. They say 23 hours a day, but it's 23 hours and 15 minutes because by the time you get out there, it's a whole other story. But I had anxiety, I had fear, and I was scared. And I could hear John's voice say, get on your knees, dummy. And I got on my knees and I said, please help, thank you, amen. I got on that bunk. If I got any kind of relief, I got back down and I said, thanks. In the first couple of days of being locked up by myself in that prison cell, for the first time in my life, I looked in the mirror, this little thing they had, and I admitted to my innermost self that I'm an alcoholic. I didn't tell anybody else. I admitted it to me and my life took a different direction, right? I was locked up, but I wasn't locked up here. Right at three months and twenty-seven days, I got a lady came to me and said, "Hey, you're being released." Some judges in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous in my area signed a piece of paper to give it to the the judge that sentenced me. She reduced my sentence to a suspended sentence, so I had to serve my time in the community. And I've been an active member of Alcoholics Anonymous in good standing since that day. Um, well, I guess it depends on who you ask in my area, but I think pretty good standing. <laughs> right? And what happened, man, is I got on fire. Right? And I started doing Alcoholics Anonymous, and I started taking meetings back to the jail, and I started doing those things. I'm here to tell you the men's I had to make. You know, my daughter was, uh, look, my daughter is just graduated with her master's in criminal law. She's working at the courthouse. She's getting ready to go to law school. She wants to be a Supreme Court judge or a judge, right? That's what her goal is, right? And I remember a few months ago, I was walking through the house, and there was a bunch of these sorority girls or whatever they are in my kitchen. And they were trying to talk my daughter into running for president of the United States. So I said, well, hey, if you become president of the United States, can I have a cabinet position? She said, no. She didn't even hesitate, right? She didn't even. And I said, well, what can I do? She said, you could be a greeter. (laughs) So if my daughter makes it to the White House, you better get there fast because I might not have the job for long, right? But I'm not, man, I'm the kind of father. I remember when my daughter was 17 years old, my wife came to me. and She said, hey, we're going to go on vacation. I said, where are we going? She said, Canada. I said, I can't go to Canada. She said, we know. <laughs> and away they went, right? And they're gone for a couple weeks. And I'm, I call it dog sitting my own dog. But my wife says, you don't dog sit your own dog. You pay, take care of your own dog. But that's a whole other story, right? <laughs> they're gone. They come home. And when they get home, my daughter goes straight to her room. And my wife comes in the kitchen and says, hey, we need to talk. I said, yeah, okay. She goes, no, I need to talk to you. It's serious, right? And then I thought, well, maybe she's divorcing me, moving to Canada. Did they wreck it? I mean, I had a whole bunch of thoughts, that, the real bad thoughts, right, that, the worst. And I said, okay, I can handle it. She goes, well, when we were up in Canada, Bailey got a tattoo. I wasn't ready for that. <laughs> Not at all. I saw red. I saw tramp stamp. I saw stripper poles. I saw Aerosmith videos. <laughs> Man, I went batshit crazy, right? I called my wife names and told her she was going to jail. I got to figure out how to get that tattoo off. We're getting divorced. I mean, look, I got, I was locked. I have a sleeve. I have my, I'm not tat free, right? But when it's your 17 year old daughter, somebody's getting the, going to be hurting, right? And my wife's just looking at me like I'm crazy, right? So I went upstairs, man, and I started, I gave everything I had to my daughter. I called her things and told her things, and she's on the bed crying. And I, I said things to her that if you said to her, I'm not afraid to go back to jail, right? Wasn't going really well in that room, so I went back down round two with my wife. And this is where the conversation gets a little different. She said she kicked me out of the house. I told her I was going for a drive. And what I did is I got in my car, and I do what every good alcoholic does in a situation like this. I called an Al-Anon, right? Because I figured they know how to get divorces. They know how to get alcoholics arrested. And they probably gotten a few tattoos removed in their time, right? But I called the wrong one, Right? I call this lady, and I'm explaining to her what happened. And here's, here's what I learned in that little moment in Alcoholics Anonymous and al on. If I call an alcoholic and I tell him my problem, they give me the solution, usually before I'm done explaining the problem, right? You call an al I don't know if they write it out and text it to other people and look for other advice. I don't know if they think about what you're saying. If they re- Man, it took like three miles before this lady responded with something, right? And... Uh, she, she said, you want to know what I just heard? I said, absolutely. What do I do? She said, well, you just told your daughter she's not beautiful. And any decisions she makes are not to your standards. And her body's your body. And she said a whole bunch of stuff. It made me sound really bad, right? I said, well, I didn't mean any of all that. And she goes, I know. I go, what do I got to do? She goes, you got to go back and make that right. And I could hear her husband in the background going, you better invite God to go with you. So I'm going like this down the road, right? 
I don't need no AA help. I got this under control, right? And so I, I get back to my house, and I sit in my driveway, and I invite God to go with me. And I go back inside that house, and I told my wife I overreacted. She said, you did. And I went upstairs, and my daughter's still crying. 17-year-old young girl still crying 30 minutes later. And I had to apologize. I said, man, I'm an idiot, right? I don't care what you do with your body. I don't care who you love. I don't care what you believe. All you need to know is you're the best thing I've ever been involved with, and I love you no matter what. And she goes, I know, Dad. And I go, she goes, you, we knew you were going to overreact. And so I became a victim, right? You know what I mean? Well, why don't you call me or text me or something, right? Or show me. And she goes, you want to see the tattoo? <laughs> sure. And she lifts up her shirt, and on the side of her chest, there's an AA symbol, and it says one day at a time. And there's a hand going like this and a hand going like this. So my first inside voice is, Jesus, I hope you're not an alcoholic. And what's with the praying hands? We're not Catholic. But I, that's inside voice, right? I've learned something in the last 30 minutes. And she said, uh, you want to know what it means? I said, sure. She said, if it wasn't for Alcoholics Anonymous, you, you and mom would have never met and I wouldn't be here. I said, oh, that's pretty good. And she said, the hand going like this is mom's hand because she's always serving the coffee and making the cookies. And the hand like this is yours, Dad, because you're always welcoming people to Alcoholics Anonymous and giving them a hand up. So now I'm sitting on the bed crying, Right? This lady, Polly, told me, Pistol, told me that was God kicking me in the nuts. <laughs> so I avoid her. <laughs> you know, and, and that's my life, man. I, I, man, I get myself in some predicaments. <laughs> Amy knows. We were in Turks and Caicos last week. We came here for this, and uh, my wife's still in Turk and, Turks and Caicos with this guy we call Aquaman. He might be the most beautiful guy in AA, right? Yeah, it's not good for me, but, uh, <laughs> yeah. He just made the CD. Now I'm going to hear that guy forever. (laughs) Ah, man, I hope my wife don't hear this talk. Uh, But if Aquaman gets me in trouble, we'll know. Uh, The men's with my grandparents. You know, uh, my grandpa was alive. You know, so I went to my grandpa's house and I sat down with him. I told Grandpa, I'm an Alcoholics Anonymous. He says, everybody knows you're an Alcoholics Anonymous. I said, well, I don't know if you know this or not, Grandpa, but I borrowed a lot of money and stole a lot of money from you and Grandma. He goes, oh, I know. I go, I don't know how much. He goes, I do. (laughs) He goes into my Grandma's room, and he comes back out, and he has these spiral notebooks from, like, 1977. Every dime I borrowed, I said, Jason borrowed 25 cents. Jason mowed lawn, has 10 cents credit. I mean, every IOU, every contract. The lady was like the mob, really is what she was, right? And I'm just looking at these, and I'm just going, no way. I mean, there's, I bought stuff that doesn't even exist, right? And I, I told him, man, Grandpa, I can't pay all this back. He goes, oh, I know you can't. I said, well, what can I do to make it right? He says, you just keep helping people. I was like, oh, that's great, right? But I started looking at these things because it's like looking at your, you know, a, a diary kind of in a way. It's just your money. And in 1984, it said, Jason stole $5. Jason stole $5. Jason stole $5. So I sent him, hey, how do you know I stole $5 in 1984? He goes, oh, that's an easy one, right? And this is like 2000 or 19, probably, yeah, probably 2001, 2002. So it's been a while, right? I go, how do you know I stole that $5? He goes, that's easy. Every Thursday night, I put $5 in a coffee, coffee cup in the hutch. Every Friday morning, it was gone. <laughs> Grandma lives here, you live here, and I live here. Who do you think stole it, Grandma. And I was like, well, you're probably right. It was me. But I said, if you knew it was me, why didn't you tell me to stop? He said, Jason, many times I asked you to stop. I asked you if you stole it, and you told me no. I said, but you knew I did. And he said this to me. He said, Jason, stealing isn't wrong until it's wrong to you. And I'd rather you steal from me than our neighbors or your friends. And that's the guy I thought was out to get me. Right? That's the guy I thought hated me. That's the guy I thought was never there for me. So I got in my car and I'm driving. I called John. He goes, how much do you have to pay back? I said, nothing. So I went back. <laughs> Grandpa, that's not going to work. You know, I have to do something to make this right. And found out in the conversation that he would never pay for bottled water or TV. He had been hating it during the pandemic. huh? But uh, So I said, hey, can I get you cable TV? He goes, whatever. If you want to get cable TV, you can get it. So I got cable TV hooked up at his house. And a couple weeks after his cable TV got hooked up, he called me. We talked for like two hours. We talked about Pawn Stars. We talked about ESPN being on all the time. We talked about the history. I mean, he was just 
he had four channels until he got cable TV, right? He had an antenna. And, uh, you know, at the end of that conversation, he said, man, this is one of the greatest gifts anybody's ever gotten me. And I was making amends, right? I was doing the next right thing, and I got the benefit of that. And when he died, we were good. My, my grandma, on the other hand, uh, when somebody's dead, it's hard to make amends, right? I wrote letters. I went to the grave site. I looked for dragonflies, butterflies, ants, potato bugs, bluebirds. I, uh, I, I, I wrote stuff. I read stuff. I did everything you could possibly do that you guys would suggest to me. And I would get relief, but I would still ache. You know, in the keys of the kingdom, it talks that ache so far deep down that you can't get rid of. I had that. Right? And I just didn't know how to get rid of it. And I would pray, and I would pray, and I would pray. About 10 years ago, 12 years ago, I was flying home on a plane. Obviously, I didn't have my phone in airplane, airplane mode. And I got a text from this guy named Jimmy Jack. Jimmy Jack's like a, he's a big book guy. That's all I'll say about that. Right? He texted me this because Jimmy Jack learned that, hey, I'm the kind of guy that, uh, if you give me clear-cut directions sometimes, huh? but if you can tell me a story and I can feel it, I get it. Right? And what happened was he sent me this story, and it was about this little boy. And uh, he was the firstborn in his family, and his sisters were born, and his dad started paying attention to his sisters, and he got jealous. But he knew his dad loved football. So he asked his mom and dad, can I play football? And they signed him up, and right away he realized this is a bad idea, right, because he's a trumpet player. (laughs) But after every single game and every single practice, his dad would come find him and give him a hug and tell him he loved him and how proud he was of him. So the kid kept playing and playing and playing. All the way to his senior year at high school, his team's getting, going to the state championship. And a couple weeks before the big game, he's at practice, and the coach calls him over and says, uh, Son, I don't know how to tell you this, but your dad had a heart attack today, and he didn't make it. And a young man hit his knees, and he's crying, and people are gathering around him. And he, he gets up, and he asks the coach, Hey, can I go home a little early from practice today? The coach said, Man, this is just a game. Go home and take care of your family and your dad and do what you have to do. Don't worry about football. And the young man left, and that big game came two weeks later, and it's like the third quarter, and his team's losing really bad, and he didn't show up till the third quarter. And when he came running out, everybody started cheering. And he ran up to the coach. He said, hey, can I play? And the coach was like, whatever, we're losing anyway, get in there. And the kid intercepts the ball, and he runs it back for a touchdown. The coach was like, that's odd. And then he makes some tackles, and he ends up winning the game for his team, right? The worst player probably in the history of his school, right? wins the state championship, right? And so that night, as the coach is leaving the locker room, he sees the kid sitting in the back all by himself, and he walks over and starts talking to him. He says, man, take as long as you want. And the kid says, thanks. And the coach says, I just need to ask you something. He goes, I've coached you for four or five years now. You're probably not the best football player I've ever coached. What happened out there tonight? And the young man said, coach, I don't know if you know this tonight, but the games that you didn't play me and I sat on the bench or the games that I played and I lost the game for the team, No matter what, my dad would come up and he'd give me a hug and tell me he loved me and how proud he was of me. And the coach said, man, you had a good dad. And he started to walk away, and the young man says, Coach, I don't know if you know this or not, but my dad was blind, and tonight's the first night he ever really got to see me play. And just like that, I got relief. Because I know that every time I walk into a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous and I say, my name is Jason Johnson, I'm an alcoholic. Or I see a new guy sitting in a meeting, and I walk up to him and I say, man, I haven't seen you here before. Can I get you a cup of coffee? Or somebody says, man, I don't fit in. I tell them, come sit by me. Anybody can sit by me. I don't care. My grandma gets to see that. She's seen everything I've done. And I know that when I die and I go to that big meeting in the sky, that's where I'm going first, right? Because I'm going to make sure there's a bill of Bob and a Jesus, right? One of those three ain't there. I'll let you guys know. But I know who will be in that parking lot waiting to greet me. It will be my grandparents, Right? And I know my grandpa, he thinks if you're not a half hour early, you're late. And I don't know how that works when you're dead, but he'll probably wave to me because he never thinks I know where I'm going, right? <laughs> but here's the deal. Because I've been hugging men in Alcoholics Anonymous when it wasn't convenient or necessary. I'm going to be able to hug my grandpa as an adult for the first time and tell him I love him and thank him for giving me a safe place to live. My grandma's probably be dancing and praising Jesus and thanking God telling my grandpa, I told you so. Right? And I know what she's going to do. She's going to hug me. She's going to tell me she loves me. And she's going to tell me she's proud of me. And for the first time in a long, long time, I'm going to be able to look my grandma in the eyes and say, Grandma, it's the damnedest thing. These people in this thing called Alcoholics Anonymous, they found a solution to their problem and they introduced it to me. But most importantly, Grandma, some of those folks showed me some grace. And in doing that, they introduced me to that kid inside of here that you only believed existed. 
that might not be a big deal to you, but if you're an alcoholic who's powerless over alcohol and you have somebody that wouldn't give up on you, it's a big deal, right? And, uh, man, if you're new here, if you're struggling, if you only hear this, what I'm going to tell you right now is I want to tell you thank you for not giving up on yourself. Thank you, right? I'll end with this story. A, a couple of months ago, I had to speak in the Indiana State Convention, right? And I get there, and right away, they got the wrong guy, right? Because it's like a delegate, GSR, all that kind of guru stuff, right? And I'm thinking, oh, shh, they got the wrong guy. I even told the guy who was my host, hey, I'll, I'll pay my own flight home. <laughs> you need to find somebody else. I'm not this kind of guy, right? He said, oh, it'll be all right. And I look up, and the slogan for this, this conference was, a seat for everyone. And I just thought, yeah, this is going to bite them in the ass in about three days, right? But I said, all right. And I hung in there, and I went to every event they had, man, and I fell in love with Alcoholics Anonymous, right? I got to see stuff. I got to hear this guy. I got the guy that got the little triangle taken out of the big book. He said he didn't do it. He was just the guy who was a chair. But they were teasing him, and I got to meet. I mean, it was, man, I was just fascinated, right? And then the conference, the I had to speak the banquet that night, right? And I get up there and I give my talk. And after they talk, they have these things, you know, they have gratitude lines at some meetings. I don't know why they call them gratitude because 20% of the people don't like you, right? They either, you swore or you talked about drugs or you went to AA or they're like, tell their sponsor, well, that's an hour of my life I'll never get back. And their sponsor says, oh, you better go thank them for that, right? And they come up and thank you. That's an hour of my life I'll never get back, right? So when I'm in a gratitude eye, I'm always... You know, you looking down there, and I'm looking down the line, and I lock eyes with a lady like that, and I, so I look down because she had that look, right? And I look again, and she locks eyes, and I'm like, oh, man, that's her. She's pissed. She wants, she's going to, I just knew it, right? She, she looked like that perfect little AA person that was just coming to rip me, right? So I'm saying, thank you, thank you, but I'm thinking she's got to be here soon. Thank you, thank you, and she's not there, right? So I look up where she should be, and she's not there, and I go, oh, thank you, God. And I look to the back of the line, and she's at the back of the line. We lock eyes again. I'm like, oh, sheesh. She's really pissed, right? It's going to be like a 10-minute lecture, right? So I'm like, thank you, thank you. And finally, it gets down to her and I. And she's standing in front of me, and I'm standing in front of her. And she's looking at me, and her eyes are kind of like this. And she says, uh, I'm a grandma. Can I give you a hug? I said, man, absolutely. <laughs> I thought you were going to be yelling at me, right? I didn't say that. But I was like, I hugged her for a long time. And she stepped back and she said, you know, uh, I have a granddaughter that's 24 years old. And she's out there running and she's doing stuff with her body and she's doing some bad things. Everybody's saying bad things about her. But she's my granddaughter and I love her. And uh, she said, I'm not supposed to be here tonight. She said, I'm not a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm not a member of that other fellowship. I'm here because my friend from church who pays pays for my granddaughter every Sunday... Her and her husband had tickets to this banquet, and he got sick, and she had called me and asked me if I wanted to come hear a story of hope. And I stood there, and, you know, we kind of just talked a little bit more, and I just thought, man, you know, I didn't know what to think. And so she started to walk away, and she turned around, and she goes, hey, do you know why your grandma wrote all that stuff down in them books? I said, no, I asked my grandpa one time, and he just laughed and said he didn't know either, and he changed the channel, right, on the TV, so... (laughs) I never really followed through with it. She goes, I know why she did it. And I go, why is that? And she said, because your grandma knew that no matter all the bad things what people are saying about you, that one day you'd come back and make it right. And so I, my eyes started watering. I'm trying not to cry. And she said, I'm proud of you. And she walked off, right? And I remember sitting down. I remember sitting there thinking to myself, I think I just made amends to my grandma, right? Because that lady was a member of a church. Her daughter was about the granddaughter was about the same age I was, right? And so I'm sitting there trying to, you know, doing your look, and I look down, and there's these feet standing next to me. And this, I look up, and there's this big kid standing there. And he's like, "Man, I heard that." He goes, "I felt that. It gave me goosebumps." I said, "Man, that was God telling you you're welcome, right?" And uh, we started talking. I found out he had a little over 60 days, and we started talking about the buzz. Right? He goes, I've never felt anything like that before. I've never been part of that. And I thought to myself, I hope everybody in Alcoholics Anonymous one day gets them goosebumps. Right? That you look in the mirror and you're all right with who you are. Thanks.
Ahorita, 